All right. <clears throat> Today I want to talk with you about being a woman of wisdom. Your life up to now, if you've lived, and you understand the difference between just living and really living, and what I mean is just, you know, if you've tried, if you've really tried, if you've gone after some things in life, if you've put yourself out there, if you if you decided that you wanted to get that you got married, if you wanted to have kids and you had kids and if you've tried or couldn't accomplish some of these things, but you've tried, you've really tried, you've really put yourself out there, you've tried to be involved in church and and you've put yourself into positions where you could, you know, fail and 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 all of the things that it it takes for you to just try with your life to do something rather than just exist. If you've tried, if you've lived, if you've really gone after life at all, then I can tell you this that I know also you have experienced pain and difficulty and struggle, upset. You've experienced difficult and disturbing experiences at times. And all of these things in your life have, have brought about some changes in your life. And what I believe that God wants me to talk with you about today is this. Embracing being a woman of wisdom. The Bible is full of stories about women. Some were great women and some were not so great women. And, and there were so many things that the women in the Bible had to overcome. And I, I hope that you've spent some time in your personal life reading about these things. And, and, you know, I know our women's group, some of the studies that they do, they go through some of the women in the Bible and they learn about the things that, that they've experienced in their lives. And they learn how to emulate that and what to do and what not to do and what worked and what didn't work in their relationship with God. And God gave us these stories so that we could be encouraged and we could have wisdom for ourselves. And, and as I read through some of the and thought through some of the women in the Bible this week, I started thinking about the different things that they faced. And one of the things that they faced, and it was a recurring issue that is in the Bible, is barrenness. It seems that one of the, the women with the greatest purpose, you know, for their life in the Bible uh, was, was, were those that couldn't bear children. And yet that purpose in their life was to bear a child. And it's so interesting to see how those women went for so long without a baby. And, and, you know, you've got Sarah, you've got Rebecca, you've got Rachel, you've got Samson's mom, you've got the Shunammite woman, you've got all these different women that experienced this. And, and all of them were barren without children and their greatest Pain in life was also their greatest purpose in life. Interesting, isn't it? And I would say to you that maybe if you stop and look at the greatest pain in your life and think about it, you might be able to find also your greatest purpose in this life and what God would use you for greatly. There are also women in the Bible that were abandoned they were either abandoned because their husbands died or, or because their husbands divorced them. One single mom, she was a widow, her husband passed away and he left her with a ton of debt. Everybody say, wasn't he a great guy, right? And he left her with two sons and this debt, she couldn't even begin to pay, a, pay for it. So they took her sons into slavery to pay for the debt. That is a painful, agonizing life, wouldn't you say? <clears throat> but you know what? God found a way to provide for her. He found a way to take care of her. But this is a woman in the Bible that had to look to God for the answers for her pain and her struggles in her life. Great purpose was found in her pain. And it's amazing how God was able to provide for her through the prophet Elisha. Go read the story. Then there are also women who had health issues, really bad health issues, whether it be depression or physical disease. They faced a lot of struggles and problems. Martha, you know, the story of Mary and Martha. Martha dealt with anxiety. And what couples with anxiety most often is some depression, right? Then there's the woman with the issue of blood. This woman had, had blood. She was bleeding for 12 years of her life. What comes with that? She was anemic. She was pale. She was exhausted. 
She had, she had trouble breathing. She had headaches. She had all of the symptoms that come with that. She was dizzy, dry, flaky skin, hair loss. She was irritable. You can only imagine the difficulty that this lady lived with for 12 years of her life. She probably didn't have someone helping her. She didn't have a husband. And because of her situation, how could she even work? She was struggling. They didn't have all the modern products and technology for, for ladies back then. It was an awful situation for 12 years of her life. How did she face all of that? But she found Jesus. And she reached out and she touched the hem of his garment, didn't she? There are women who were exhausted in the Bible. So many things hit them all at once. You know the story of Naomi. Her husband and her two sons, all three of them passed away and she's left with these daughter-in-laws. That how, how am I going to take care of them? Everything just fell apart all at once in her life. Then you've got Esther. The entire Jewish population was on her shoulders. This young woman was chosen at just that moment to protect them and save them from some great holocaust. All of the nation of Israel was on her shoulders. Wow. Talk about being exhausted at the end of the day. Deborah. Did you know in the, in the Old Testament there was a lady that was a prophet and a judge? Isn't that awesome? Don't you know she was exhausted at the end of the day? Mary, the mother of Jesus. Well, you can imagine, you know, everybody looks and goes, whoa, wouldn't it have been great to be the mother of Jesus? Well, I have a feeling that it was exhausting. Imagine what it was like, you know, she's pregnant with God and then she has the baby and from birth till death. I mean, from, from, from a mother's perspective, her life was full. It was just an absolute emotional train wreck. She was exhausted. But I love it that on the backside of it all, we read that Mary was involved in the church. Isn't that awesome? She was involved in the beginning of the church and everything moving forward. The mother of Jesus. She wasn't too good for it. Isn't that great? Then there were those that were belittled or even worse, they were abused. Do you remember the lady that was brought out before Jesus and thrown at his feet? And they were saying, you need to, you need to have us stone her because of the law. She was belittled. And in, in, in so many ways, it was abusive. Women that were put down, they were judged. They didn't even want to exist and curse the day that they were born. Why exist? Why have children if they're just going to grow up and bring me heartache? Barren. Abandoned. Bleeding. Exhausted. And belittled. I was thinking about the woman at the well. I love this story, and some of you have heard it. It's an amazing story. One day, Jesus was traveling with his disciples, and they came to a well, and the guys were like, hey, Jesus, we're going to go in town and get some Chick-fil-A. You you're going to stay here. And Jesus looked at them very sternly, and he said, not Chick-fil-A, Burger King. <laughs> and they were like, okay. So they went. And they went into town and Jesus sat down by the well. And, and this woman comes out of the town and it says it was, it was a Samaritan woman. Hang on. It says she came to draw water from the well and Jesus asked her, would you please give me a drink of water? Now imagine this is outside of town. Jesus is out there by himself. She comes up. Had to be a very awkward moment. You wonder when she saw him, if she saw him as she was approaching the well and, and looked and said, okay, this is going to be awkward. There's a guy there. I'm by myself. I need water. All right. I don't feel like walking out here later. I need to go ahead and just get the water. You don't know what the situation was. Or maybe she walked up to the well and Jesus was like, ha, you know, and scared her. We don't know what the situation was, but she walks up and, and you know, it was an awkward moment. And she was feisty. This woman was feisty. If you read the scripture, it's just an amazing story. She was cynical. She's lived life 
She's, she's, she sees through life. You can hear her. She's letting Jesus know in this situation. She's not vulnerable. You're not going to take advantage of me. You can imagine what she's thinking, how strange it is that some guy's sitting out here. What's he waiting for? He's, he's in the, at the well in the middle of the day. This is weird. This is awkward. And so she, she had this conversation with him, and she went back and forth and look at it. She said, you're a Jew, and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink of water with, when Jews and Samaritans won't have anything to do with each other? What are you talking about? Jesus said, you don't know what God wants you to give you. You don't know what God wants to give you, and you don't know who is asking you for a drink. If you did, you would ask me for the water that gives life. And she said, you don't even have a bucket. What's she saying? What's wrong with you? You're crazy. You don't even have a bucket. How are you going to give this life-giving? She, she does what my, yeah, this life-giving water. <laughs> she said, so Jesus looks at her and says, everyone who drinks this water will get thirsty again. The water that you're getting. But no one who drinks the water I give will ever be thirsty again. The water I give is a life, is like a flowing fountain that gives eternal life. So she plays along with him. She's like, okay, sir. Yeah, come on, please give me a drink of this water. Then I won't get thirsty and have to come to this well again. Suddenly, with one statement, Jesus gets very serious with her. And he cuts straight to the core and he locates her. He hits her with words that stops her in her tracks. And he says, go and bring your husband. <sighs> okay. I don't have a husband. And Jesus says, <clears throat> you're right. You're telling the truth. You don't have a husband. You've already been married five times and the guy you're living with is not your husband. Now, he wasn't condemning her. He was locating her. He was directly communicating with her. This is where you are. This is what your life is like. This is what it's been like. And this woman has had a life of pain. She's fighting to survive day after day. Going from husband to husband, just hoping to have a place to live and, and food to eat. And at the moment, she was living with this guy, and Jesus wasn't condemning her. He was just saying, this is where you are. This is what your life has been like. You've had a lot of pain. The woman left the water jar. The very purpose for her coming out there, she left it behind, and she just ran into town, and she started yelling, come and see a man who told me everything that I've done. Could he be the Messiah? Everyone in town went out to see Jesus. You can imagine what the disciples were like when they came back with their, their Burger King. They were like, where did all these people come from? So Jesus stayed in town for two days teaching and preaching at that town, a Samaritan town. It's just a beautiful story. And look how it ends. They told the woman, the people in town, they said, we no longer have faith in Jesus because of what you said, but we have faith in Jesus because we've heard him for ourselves and we are certain that he is the savior of the world. Isn't that awesome? So the assumption here that we can make is that this woman started out life very naive like all of us do. Oh, everything is good. The sky is the limit. I can go out and just be free and do whatever I want and enjoy life and try to live and, and just be naive and everything is good. Everything's going to work out. She probably lived life without any kind of caution, promiscuous, and she ended up with all these bad men lined up one after another. And then what happens after you get a dose of reality is you become cynical in life, right? Right? And listen, it seems to be that this is the happy way to live, that we can just be naive and hear no evil, see no evil and speak no evil. And everything is going to be great. Everything's going to be easy. Everything's going to be fine. And many of you started your lives that way, right? If not all of us. But we get into adulthood and we're like, all right, I've got the I've got the world by the tail and I can do whatever I want. I'm ready to move and I'm ready to go. And then life comes and hits you hard and you realize the reality of life is difficult. You know, naive people are very optimistic. 
And they have no idea the evil that is in the world and no idea that evil even resides within our hearts. And in many respects, it seems that naivety is what we want to get back to. But that's not what God is calling us to. And it seems like in church that we'll listen to sermons that's calling us to just go back to naivety and pretend that evil doesn't exist. Pretend the bad stuff that happened in your life doesn't exist. The pain that you've experienced in your life, that it doesn't exist. And let's just, let's just worship God and forget about all the bad stuff. And let's just pretend that everything is great. Everything is fine. And naivety seems to be the way to happiness. If you could just put some rose-colored glasses on and walk around and see everything through these beautiful rose-colored glasses, then everything is going to be fine. Forget about your pain. So what happens? You hit the wall of reality. And what's reality? You find yourself to become suddenly cynical. Being cynical, listen, is not bad. It can be bad if you get stuck there. But being cynical is better than being naive because at least it connects with reality. At least you stop and go, okay, this life is painful. This life has struggles. There are things that have happened to me. That aren't good, that aren't fun, and I've felt it. And here's the truth cynicism is on the path to wisdom. And when you become cynical in life and you finally go, okay, this bites, this hurts, pain happens, I don't get things the way I want them all the time, you find yourself in that spot. Listen, you're on the path towards wisdom. You're not there yet if you're stuck there, but you're on the way. And the woman at the well found herself very cynical, didn't she? Listen, if you believe that people are motivated by self-interest, welcome to cynicalness. If you believe or if you doubt that something worthwhile and good is ever going to happen in your life, if you doubt that good is going to happen in your life, if you doubt that anything worthwhile is going to come to you, that something good is going to happen to you, welcome past being naive. And if you look at those who are supposed to be good people and doubt that they're good, welcome to reality. You're on the path. Towards wisdom. You see, you can live a life of ignorance, pretending that all is well, pretending that there are no threats, but reality happens all too often, doesn't it? You see, the key to a full life is not the pursuit of happiness, it's the pursuit of meaningfulness. And if you find meaning in this life, happiness will follow. You see, we were born naive, beaten into cynicism, but invited to wisdom. And so today is an invitation for you to move past whatever level that you're stuck in. If you think that you just need to be thoughtful and happy and peaceful, you can move past that. It's okay. If you're stuck in cynicism, okay, welcome to that level. But it's time to move past that. And that's wisdom. Move into wisdom. You're invited to wisdom today. Beyond being utterly disappointed and cynical, the woman at the well found that there was an invitation to be a woman of wisdom. You see, here it is. Cynicism with courage to fear and trust God is faith. And that's wisdom. 
Let me say this again. Cynicism with courage to fear and trust God is faith. And that's wisdom. You can look at your life and figure out where you are on this path. Okay, so let's, let's look at uh, when maybe you got married. Before you got married, you probably had that guy. And you were like, oh man, he's awesome. He's so sweet. He's so cute. He's so wonderful. He's wonderful. And it didn't matter who anybody said, anybody said anything about him. You know, if your mom came to you and was like, man, I don't know about this guy, honey. If your dad was like, look, I see some things about this guy. What, what did you do? Uh-uh, hear no evil, see no evil, and speak no evil, right? And you just ignored the fact that mom or dad didn't think this was the right guy. And, and then what happened? So you were naive. Then you got married. Guess what? He couldn't hide from you anymore, right? And then you realize... Oh, man, there's some real stuff about this guy. He doesn't always smell good. <laughs> there's some real things happening with this guy. What happens? Then you can be, you become cynical. You become real, uh, realistic about the situation, about this marriage. <clears throat> but then after that, what happens? If you, don't get, if you get stuck in cynicism, you're in trouble. And you'll always be critical of your husband. But you can move beyond that into being a woman of wisdom. Amy. <laughs> it's the reality. You know, when you had your baby, right? Oh, it's going to be wonderful. It's going to be beautiful. It's going to be awesome. This baby I'm going to hug and hold and just smell this baby. Oh, y'all know the baby smell, right? Every woman in here knows it. And then the baby comes and you're like, Oh, just go to sleep. Oh, you stink, you know. And reality sets in. Then you can become cynical. Then for the rest of their life, you can just be like, oh, stop. Just grow up already. Or you can become a woman of wisdom. It's the invitation to grow beyond cynicism. Now, the woman that gets stuck in naivety, her kids are just off doing whatever they want and going to end up getting ran over by a bus. But knowing reality and then embracing wisdom beyond that to apply. Listen, this is the path to love. True love. You can also look around you and see the people that you hang out with and see where you are in this situation. Um. If you're a naive person, you're going to go to a church that only tells jokes all the time and has fun and just kind of barely, you know, gets you to a place of salvation. And you're just going to be there on the surface for things. But if you're somebody that, that has moved past that and says, all right, life is too real. I need to know some answers for this stuff. And I want to get into, you know, understanding why I feel so cynical then you're going to move past that, right? But if you want to get stuck in cynicism, you're just going to sit out there and you're going to, you're going to judge and you're going to look around and go, that pastor, he probably doesn't even live this stuff himself, you know? And you're going to look and find reasons that you don't believe, look and find reasons that you won't have friends, and you're just going to be alone because you've quit believing in friendship, you've quit believing in love. If you get stuck in cynicism... That's where you are probably even in a marriage if you're stuck there. But if you surround yourself with people that have moved past naivety into cynicism, into wisdom. If you begin to surround yourself with these people. <clears throat> then you're going to find your meaning and purpose in this life. People who have found that. Not only is there something that's worth dying for, but there's also something that's worth living for. People who don't just live a life that is good because it's common sense to live good, a good life. Not just because of that, but people who've moved beyond that to say, you know what? I'm going to live the life that God calls me to live because I love him and I love people. 
There are no laws against doing things that are good. Isn't that awesome? And that's the way God's kingdom is. People, people who when hell's best came against them, these are the kind of people you want to surround yourself with. And honestly, that's who's here today. These are the people that when hell's best came against them, they said, you know what? I'm not going to get stuck in cynicism. I don't have to shrink back and pretend that there's no evil, that everything is okay. I'm going to move forward and be a person of wisdom that understands that this is all about God's kingdom and learning to love him and learning to passionately have a relationship with him and his people, no matter what happens in this world, I'm going to worship him and I'm going to use it for God's kingdom and purpose in my life. I think of my mom. Mom, close your ears. <laughs> you know, like, like you, she's, she's struggled through her life. And fortunately, the one really good thing that God gave her to work with and manage all the other things in her life was a good husband. <laughs> that was my dad. This December, they'll be celebrating 60 years. Isn't that awesome? <clears throat> she was born to an alcoholic father, not just an alcoholic father, but a mean alcoholic father. He was the nicest person in the world when he was sober, but when he was drunk, he was mean. And she has memories that none of you want to know about. Her mom was the epitome. I don't mean this. I'm not exaggerating. I'm not exaggerating. She was the epitome of jealousy, manipulation. That was dad again. <laughs> we need a muzzle up here, don't we? <laughs> it was just a reaction. <laughs> um, the epitome of selfishness and uh, adulterous. Growing up with parents like that in a household like that. Some of you have been there. Mom had meningitis when she was three. And it messed up her whole health system and her body and, and all kinds of health problems all these years. She had brain surgery in her 30s because of all of that. Um, she gave birth to three children. One of her kids was so hyperactive, my brother, and just trying to wrangle his own mind he grew up and began began to use alcohol and drugs to to try to figure things out it it just destroyed his life and watching a son do that to himself is just one of the most difficult things that a mother could possibly do you know uh, her daughter my sister grew up and she was beautiful beautiful girl she got married to a narcissist and we didn't realize for 20 years the guy was abusing her and um, then to find that out, and, and uh, after she finally got free from that, now she's got dementia at 55 years old, 56 years old. And to, for a mom to, to see these things happen in their kids' lives, and she's had fickle friends. All of you have had fickle friends. It hurts when you get betrayed or denied from a friend. And she's lost two daughters-in-law. She's uh, to, to, to divorce and a son-in-law to divorce. She's, she's missed the opportunity of, of seeing three of her grandkids raised because of divorce in her, in her son's life and her daughter's life. She lost a daughter-in-law daughter that she dearly loved to death. And her health has been just far less than stellar, as you all know. Now. You all have your struggles and your pains. And I tell you, it would have been easy, so easy for my mom to become one of those mean old women that nobody wants to be around. At any point in her life, she could have just flipped a switch and said, you know what? I deserve. I'm done with this. Everyone else seems to be having their own way. I'm going to just do what I want. I'm going to demand what I want. And that's the kind of person that I'm going to be for the rest of my life. But instead, she moved beyond being cynical. She moved into a realm of wisdom that has allowed her to be a person of love and peace and joy. 
And every chance she gets to have joy in her life, she takes it. If you'll let her get on the phone with you, she'll tell you every detail of every story to try to make you laugh. Because she wants laughter and joy in her life. She moved. You see, cynicism with courage, it takes courage to move beyond cynicism. It takes courage to say, I'm going to fear God more than I fear my pain, more than I fear my struggles. I'm going to fear him. And it takes courage to move into trust. God, I trust you that even though I don't understand all of this life and all of its pain, I trust you that you're going to make it all good one day, that you're going to bring justice to it all. And that God, I get to spend eternity with you, even if, even if this life, all of it, even if it's bad. James David, would you come? So I love, I love the end of this story of the Samaritan woman at the well. We don't have any more scripture about this lady. And, and uh, what I'm about to tell you is extra biblical. It's, it's from other sources through the Orthodox Church. But they have the history of this woman written down in her name. Her name is Fatina, and she's known as the martyr Fatini. She lived her life out in Carthage, and she preached about Jesus everywhere she went. And you know, at the time, Nero was in charge of Rome and he was doing everything that he could to stop Christianity and you understand that's why he burned Rome he wanted to blame the Christians and find a way he was doing everything he could to say this needs to stop this Christian thing Nero hated her he knew her personally and he had her son blinded and thrown into jail and while he was in jail, God healed his eyes. And he preached all about Jesus and everybody was converting to Christianity in jail. <laughs> it's reported that Fatina and her five sisters, so six women, were impacting the world for Christ so much. They were on his radar and he had them brought under the guard of his daughter. Nero's daughter had to supervise them in the Roman imperial court. And so that's where they went. And guess what happened? They started telling people about Jesus. And Fatina told Nero's daughter about Jesus. And she converted to Christianity. Isn't that awesome? It's also said that there was a woman that came in, a sorcerer, that brought in some poisoned food. And Fatina shared Christ with her and converted her to Christ. They tried to crucify these women. But it's reported that an angel of the Lord freed them and healed their wounds. Wow. Enraged by all of this, Nero ordered that the most cruel things you could possibly do to a human body be done to, to Fatina and had her thrown into a well. And her family was also cruelly treated. And I won't even go into the details of it because it's Mother's Day. But what they did to that woman is unbelievable. And she lived in that well for three days and they said, well, bring her back in. They brought her in and let her sit in a cell for 20 more days. And finally, Nero came to her and he asked her this question. Will you now relent and offer sacrifices to idols? This is the woman that Jesus saw at the well. 
Will you now relent and offer sacrifices to idols, these demons? And she looked at Nero, and I love this. She spat on him. And with vigor, she said, O impious of the blind, you profligate and stupid man, do you think me so deluded that I would consent to renounce my Lord Jesus Christ and instead offer sacrifices to idols which are as blind as you are? She said, no way. No chance. She was thrown back into the well, never denying the man that she met at the well. She was thrown into the well, and there she died, never letting go of the man she met at the well. She could have just pretended, life is good, everything's great doesn't matter how many more husbands I get. As long as I live, as long as I eat, as long as I have a place to live and eat, I'm good. I'm, everything's fine. Everything's fine. Hear no evil, see no evil. But instead, she moved into a life of cynicism, and she had it out with Jesus at the well one day. And Jesus brought her into his fold. And she became a woman of wisdom, a woman of great honor, a woman of great respect. And she changed the world to this day. your pain have you found the meaning of your pain because the greatest purpose of your life is probably wrapped up in your greatest pain in this life have you found the meaning of your life so father we thank you thank you for kingdom greats people who've gone before us God, we want so badly to be people of wisdom and honor for you. God, there are some that are here that are hurting so bad. Barren. Bleeding. having been abandoned, exhausted, or have been belittled, been cast aside as though they're meaningless. And today, I ask you, God, to give them the ability to move towards wisdom. Love, peace. They don't have to be alone. They don't have to be on the outside looking in. And that God, we would surround ourselves with each other as the world does grow darker. The kingdom of God grows brighter. And that we would lock arms hand in hand carrying each other moving forward loving each other encouraging one another knowing that you have called us to be brothers and sisters in Christ and so father I pray a blessing over these women today over their lives their homes their families their children for the young, their wombs, that God, you'd open. Let life come in, in the name of Jesus. But more than anything, that God, your purpose, your meaning, till the days, all the days of our lives, till the day we die, that God, we would be faithful. Maybe you're here today and you need Christ in your life. Just do it right now. Just ask him. <laughs> Invite him in. And 
God wants to make sense of your struggles. He wants to make sense of your pain. Let him. Come on, move past cynicism. Move into wisdom. Thank you, God. Thank you for healing.